this segment of lectures we are discussing uh, rheometers and uh, uh, different types of rheometers which are used for uh, analyzing the rheological properties and we initially spent some time uh, discussing the trade tests which are uh, uh, practice oriented tests uh, which are designed to get us some numbers so that design can be carried out. Uh, however, the flow is not controlled to the in the sense that there is no one type of flow shear or shear free flow. Uh, also the deformation may not be constant, deformation rate may not be constant, stress may not be constant. So therefore, uh, and, and the geometry which is chosen is also uh, in some way it mimics the engineering application, but uh, the flow that is uh, that happens is actually very complicated. So we can get uh, a measure of material behavior in terms of a number, but we cannot really call it a material property. Because if I change the geometry uh, slightly, I will get a different number. And so therefore, it is not really a material characterization tool from the point of view of material properties. So therefore, uh, we look at uh, in rheology those type of flows which can lead to controlled conditions and then the material properties themselves. Of course, we have seen that uh, we rather than measuring material constants directly like viscosity, we end up measuring material functions. And uh, But these material functions are independent of the geometries in which the measurement was made or the type of flow which was used and all that. So that uh, once we get the material function using that we can try to predict the material behavior in all types of flows under all types of conditions. So that is the hope uh, of doing rheology that I can do some selected experiments using that I characterize some material functions and using these material functions I will be able to predict material behavior in any general situation. So uh, the trade tests and uh, more complicated flows are generally more difficult to get material behavior from. And so we were discussing the two pro dominant type of rheometers which are controlled stress and controlled rate rheometers. So in uh, this respect uh, one uh, important uh, thing we can just uh, try to uh, make sure uh, we understand the difference between viscometer and uh, rheometer because there are many instruments which would measure uh, viscosity alone. And uh, we know in uh, the course that uh, viscosity as a material function is defined only under steady conditions. So we apply a constant strain rate and uh, measure the steady stress and uh, this of course is uh, the ratio of these two is the measure of viscosity. We alternately also saw that we could do creep in which case we apply a stress and we wait for uh, steady strain rate. And so both of these uh, in one is uh, control where you are actually controlling the position or the rate at which position changes and the other one is you are controlling directly the force which is being applied. But in both cases uh, we wait for the steady state. So viscometers generally are good instruments from the point of view of steady operation only. So generally whenever you say uh, we have a good viscometer, uh, it will only do steady state operation and therefore by definition it cannot do rheological measurements because in rheology we apply step strains, we look at things changing as a function of time, we apply sinusoidal or oscillatory stress and strain and then we again look at time changing quantities. So therefore uh, viscometers as instruments the way the motor is chosen, the way uh, the, uh, uh, the properties of motor is chosen is completely different. And uh, therefore let us just look at what happens uh, when uh, let us say you have a motor and uh, you have a sample. Uh, so generally let us say we, we are looking at uh, uh, for if let us say rotational type of rheometer, uh, we are applying uh, stress or strain in a rotational motion. So uh, generally what we have is the motor which is going to apply some uh, torque. So uh, let us say this is the torque uh, which is applied uh, by the motor. So let us say this gamma capital gamma motor is the torque of the motor. Now uh, in steady state what will happen is whatever is the torque that the motor is generating will be the torque which the sample will also feel right or the sample will uh, 
so whenever we have let us say a solid plate and a fluid which is moving next to it and uh, we have uh, this, uh, we will say that at this point whatever is the force which is uh, imposed by the solid on the fluid will be the same force fluid imposing on solid, right. It is just a, a continuity of uh, force and so similarly here also whatever is the torque that is applied by the motor on the sample under steady condition whatever is the torque by the sample applied on the motor will be the same. So, let us say if there is a sample uh, torque then uh, these two will be same for steady state. So, the motor is generating a torque and the sample is uh, uh, experiencing that torque or sample is in turn imposing that torque on the material uh, on the solid which is being used to rotate. So, this is the same thing like saying that uh, if I have uh, force balance right. If I have a force balance then under steady conditions if a velocity of the object that is moving is constant then what we have is the overall sum of forces which are acting on it will go to 0, right. Uh, so, the sum of forces uh, going to 0 implies that uh, the object is either stationary or uh, moving with constant velocity. So, this statement which is uh, let us say for a, uh, any arbitrary motion uh, for a uh, rotating motion it is the this corresponds to this that uh, at steady condition when the members are rotating at a constant rate the two torques will be the same. Now, what happens if it is not a steady state to the force balance? So, let us say this object has a mass of m then uh, we, we can say that it is m dv by dt where d v is the velocity is equal to the sum of forces right and steady state of course velocity goes to 0. Now, so similarly for a motor also we will have a inertia of the motor and then rate of change of the how the uh, rotational velocity changes. So, omega is the rotation rate and that uh, will be the sum of torque. So, it will be this minus let us say this sample right. So, if you are looking at an unsteady situation and in rheology we are always looking at unsteady situation it becomes very important as to how does motor with its inertia respond. In case of a viscometer you never have to really worry about the motor inertia because you will always wait for steady state and uh, both stress stress and strain rate have become constant. So, motor inertia is really irrelevant. You can have two different motor inertias as long as you reach the same stress same material will give you same strain rate. So, it is not really irrelevant, but let us say if you have two different motors with different inertias and then uh, how you are interested in how the torque changes as a function of time and then it becomes important to have. Uh, a strong consideration for what is the inertia of the motor. Now, what could we say should be the inertia of the motor ideally? Should it be a low value or should it be high value and why should it be low or why should it be high? Let us say inertia of motor and uh, of course, we will also have inertia of the sample. Inertia of the sample unfortunately, we cannot do anything about in the sense that that is the material we are going to measure. So, we cannot say that okay, let us uh, uh, sort of let us change the inertia because it is the sample and it will have a certain density and mass and therefore, will have a certain inertia associated with it. But so, from a motor point of view is it possible for us to state something? What, what does inertia really do? tendency to continue right that is what we know. So, therefore, if we and if we are doing an oscillatory motion and if inertia is very high then uh, what will happen is even though we think the motor is going to stop and turn it may actually go a little bit further and then turn and uh, so therefore, uh, the what we think we are applying is different compared to what the actually motor is doing. So, therefore, the inertial contribution uh, to the overall uh, motion can be very significant. And so, ideally then if inertia is small then what happens is these uh, uh, differences between what is being applied and what the motor does will be smaller. So, therefore, for one set of uh, uh, motors which are being controlled uh, with the torque mode uh, inertia is required to be low. Uh, 
Now, uh, so if you control the torque directly, so what you do is you generate, uh, you supply current or voltage to the motor and generate a torque. And so the motor will generate a torque, it has to rotate at certain rate to reach the steady state or to reach some given value, it will based on inertia. So as if it is low inertia, then it will quickly come to whatever is the prescribed motion that we are describing. So therefore, uh, in torque control, uh, low inertia motors are uh, required. E even if you have low inertia, uh, there will be some finite inertia and so therefore, there is a need to actually take into account what is the motor response itself. So most of commercial rheometer instruments today on the firmware will include information about how does motor respond under all kinds of conditions. And so in fact, uh, the inertial contributions of motor will have to be subtracted to give us the rate of change of torque which is the flu sample torque itself or the rate of change of position which is only due to sample. So therefore, contribution due to motor inertia has to be subtracted <coughs> and lower the motor, uh, the less correction you will have to be making. If your motor inertia is higher, then your correction better be very good. And so in fact, both types of rheometers are there. There are rheometers which inherently have a motor with very low inertia and therefore they will say that we are doing a very good stress control. Then there will be other sets of instruments which say that this motor inertia is higher, but we have a very good firmware which knows exactly how to uh, subtract the motor inertial contributions. And so this is uh, our uh, basically what are called stress control instruments. So in uh, these kind of cases, uh, torque is applied and uh, position is measured. Okay, and uh, generally position is measured these days uh, by using an optical uh, decoder, optical decoder. Uh, which is basically a principle that uh, you know if I have a, a rotating member, so if I let us say just uh, if I make some uh, disc let us say which is rotating and uh, on this disc if I put some gradations and so when this rotation happens the gradation will also move and if I now with some laser and detector I can try to detect as to how fast this object is moving by counting uh, because I, if I put a laser and then reflection back, uh, I can then find out how fast this object is moving. So therefore, these kind of optical decoders are what are used. So you can have a, apply a torque and let the motor move and then using an optical decoder you can try to measure as to how fast or slow the motion is. Okay. So when you are doing torque control, uh, you apply a torque, you measure the position and therefore you can measure strain as a function of time or uh, st strain rate as a function of time or whatever frequency whichever uh, you can do the measurements of strain and strain rate. Now we saw that there are many uh, types of experiments in which we want to control the strain itself. For example, stress relaxation we apply a step strain or in case of oscillatory shear we would like to apply let us say a uh, oscillatory strain instead of oscillatory stress. So then we need actually a strain control. So in a stress control instrument uh, to get strain control is not possible. So what has to be done is a feedback. So you apply a torque, you measure the position and see whether it is what you want because you by the way you are doing this on an unknown sample and if whatever the strain is, uh, so you take few quick measurements and then see what is the strain or strain rate going to be and then quickly correct the torque value that is being applied. So therefore, uh, the stress control operation in a stress controlled uh, instrument, instrument is being done through a feedback loop. And again the effectiveness of feedback loop and everything will be more effective if you know exactly your motor inertia and what it is doing because then the feedback loop will be far more effective because you will be able to quickly change torque going so that you know how motor is going to move because if it has large inertia then you will need to predict as to how much the motor is going to move. 
So, therefore, uh, the feedback uh, is an inherent component of strain control operation if you are using a stress control instrument. Yeah. So that uh, how, how much stress and how much strain or strain rate is required will vary from material to material and uh, so quite often most of these instruments will come with a lower limit and upper limit of any of these quantities. So the lowest torque that they can measure or lowest strain they can measure and so on. So generally what we do is we start with a reasonable range. So, for example, in when we do oscillatory shear, most often we say that you know let us start with 0.1 frequency to maybe about 100 radians per second as a frequency range. When we do let us say steady shear, we again say that okay, let us start from 0.1 to about 100. If it is in terms of stress, then it depends on how soft or hard the sample is. For example, shampoos and all, we may just have about 100 or 1000 Pascal as the loads. But if it is let us say asphalt, then it may even go to uh, 10 lakh or uh, uh, those kind of uh, values of, uh, so mega Pascal range of uh, stresses. So generally it depends on what sample we have. And so these are the stress control instruments and uh, in fact uh, the uh, viscometers uh, can be uh, anything, stress or strain control, it does not really matter because in the end you only wait for steady state. But given that in rheology we are necessarily interested in time dependent properties, it matters whether you have a stress control instrument or a strain control instrument because we need to know what is being done by the instrument because we are going to give a time dependent parameter for the material to experience. So the uh, other type of rheometers which are there are control strain rheometers and uh, they also are uh, rheometers where there are actually two motors used quite often in uh, so uh, what is called a control strain instrument. In this case uh, what you can do is uh, in fact you uh, use uh, one motor to uh, in, in a, and this type of motor uh, when you uh, uh, supply a particular current it will rotate at a particular rate. So therefore, it is a strain controlled uh, measurement. So you, you apply, uh, use a motor which uh, can uh, uh, rotate at a given rate or to a degree, to a given degree. And so, uh, once we apply the torque, uh, for example, let us say if I want to uh, rotate it by 10 degree, so I know how much torque to give, okay. So therefore, uh, but now you need to also measure, uh, so, sorry, how much current to give so that it will uh, rotate by 10 degrees. But now I also need to know how much torque is being applied. And so what is done is, so therefore, uh, this let us say is connected uh, and the sample is in between. So this is a sample uh, between two plates. So what, what is done is uh, the other uh, plate, you attach another motor and what happens is since this motor is uh, rotating, this will cause the sample also to rotate and uh, the overall stress torque will be generated in the fluid and so even the bottom surface uh, of the fluid will impose a stress on the bottom plate. Even though the bottom plate is stationary what will happen is the fluid will impose a force. So what you can do is you can force this motor to remain stationary and if you force the motor to retain stationary, then you can try to measure the amount of torque that is required to keep it stationary. So that way now your uh, rotation uh, of uh, and strain control is independent of the torque measurement. So the bottom motor is being used for torque measurement. So in this case therefore you are applying a strain uh, through a motor and then you are measuring the torque. In the other case we were doing exactly opposite, we were applying a torque and using optical decoder we are trying to measure the strain. So therefore this is uh, for example twin motor or a separated motor technology. So those are the types of terms which are used to describe such measurements. 
Now why do you think uh, it is important to have control strain or control stress measurements and why, why is it so important uh, for us to know about such fine details about the instrument? Why would it be of interest? I have an unknown sample for which I am doing rheology and this unknown sample I put it in the rheometer. Do I really need to care that oh is the rheometer stress control or is the rheometer strain control? Should I care and should I do my analysis accordingly or it does not matter because anyway in the software I will give that uh, you know you apply this much strain or you apply this much stress and I will get the results. So while look, looking at that analysis of the result do I really need to worry about the fact that oh maybe it is a stress control or a strain control instrument. Under what situation do you think it might be useful to know this difference? Now the first instrument where I apply stress control what I can do is I can use a feedback loop right that is what I mentioned in the previous thing. So if I, if I let us say I have to use a stress controlled instrument in a strain control operation then what I do is I apply a stress see what is the strain rate generated then modify the stress value the tor torque and so that I get a requisite strain rate make the measurement go to next stress value and see if I get the next strain rate which is my target strain rate. So but it will be done through a feedback loop. Similarly in this case if I were to do a creep experiment I cannot do a creep experiment directly I will apply I will instruct the mo top motor to rotate at certain rate or given uh, to a given degree and then I will measure how much is the torque and uh, if the torque is uh, less or more then I quickly need to do a feedback and I will need to modify the rotation okay. So, so is it important for me to know whether uh, the two instruments are uh, uh, different. So the one easy thing to realize is if I am doing let us say a stress relaxation experiment it better be done on a strain control device because if I am doing strain control it is better to do it uh, because uh, there is no feedback loop involved because Otherwise the control loop determines how effectively the strain is being applied. So if you are doing let us say a constant strain or a constant stress, so if you are doing a creep experiment it is much better to do it on a stress control right. Uh, of course though we will rarely have uh, enough uh, luxury to have all the instruments at our disposal right. So it may so happen that the lab in which we are working has only a stress control uh, rheometer but we are also want to do a stress relaxation experiment. So in that case we should know under what conditions do I expect the instrument to not perform as well as a strain control experiment or if I change go from one material to the other are there do I expect under some conditions the motor inertia to play a much bigger role. So these are the questions which are important and therefore we must know whether we are using a strain control instrument or a stress control instrument. For example if I have a very low viscosity fluid right uh, if I have a fluid uh, let us say which is a polymer solution a dilute polymer or semi dilute solution which has very low viscosity or I have a micellar solution of surfactant again with a low viscosity remember low viscosity implies the inertial contributions are little more significant sample inertia itself. So now if I am trying to use a stress control with a feedback stress control instrument with a feedback given that the inertial forces are important the feedback may not be able to correctly predict what might be the role of sample inertia. So if I am doing oscillatory shear and if I am doing I what in oscillatory shear quite often what I do is I will specify a constant strain amplitude. I will say let us say I am using uh, 1 percent strain and then I usually do a frequency sweep assuming that this is in the linear regime I will uh, do a frequency sweep and uh, what frequency sweep will imply is initial uh, measurement I will do let us say at 0 0.1 radian per second then 0 0.2 radian per second and so on and then 1, 2 and so on up to maybe 100 radians per second. So as I go to higher and higher frequency the inertial contribution start to play a bigger and bigger role because the sample is sort of doing uh, now applying the strain at very high rates 
and if there is inertia of the fluid important it may not may be doing something independent compared to what I am assuming the sample is doing. Because generally when we are applying the strain we assume that whatever is the top plate doing the rest of the sample is completely conforming to that. But if inertia is important then even though the plate has reached that right uh, the one end fluid may still continue to move to the right though the plate has already started moving to the left. So, the fluid inertia is actually going to give very different uh, contributions compared to what we are assuming in our analysis. So, in all of these cases by the way we can always take into account the fluid inertia also and then solve a problem, but it is far more complicated problem to solve. So, that is why when we do rheometric analysis we will say that we will be in those regimes of operation where fluid inertia is negligible. So, that our analysis becomes easy we can do the characterization easily. Huh. Or very high we cannot go. Exactly. So, then uh, what you say is okay if I have a low viscosity sample and I, I am using a stress control instrument then I better be careful about my 50 radians per second or 60 radians per second that data. So, there if I let us say see that G prime is increasing with frequency or sudden or G or there is a, a G double prime is decrease I, I should not immediately conclude that that is the real result. I need to check double check and then uh, look at and how, how will this double check be done? What kind of things uh, can be done to let us say researcher or a development engineer who is trying to work with these materials what are the tools available at my disposal that I read something in the book or I heard this in a lecture that at high frequency low viscosity please be careful. So, I will be careful I want to know whether the data I have got is correct or not. So, what should I do? what can I do? Uh, yeah, so, the steady shear viscosity will uh, be correctly measured because the uh, inertia of the motor or inertia of the sample is irrelevant once it comes to steady state. So, what you are talking about is torque sensitivity of, uh, of the instrument. So, that will mate, uh, that will be important if we are looking at the steady state properties. So, that is one usually one uh, parameter at our disposal is to say look at systematics of the data in the sense that if we vary a composition we have certain expectations as to what might be happening that is one way of doing it. But there again all the samples that you have are unknown the first composition itself you do not know the properties therefore, you are studying it. Now, you make uh, and yes there is some checks and balances possible the uh, other sets of things you can do is uh, for example, uh, if uh, uh, in the Gavani equations with inertia being there is the gap important for example the gap between parallel plate if I am using a parallel plate. So, I can try to measure properties at two different gaps the lower the gap the lower will be the Reynolds number at the same uh, velocity. So, lower will be the contribution of inertia. So, then do I see a systematic trend again with different gaps. So, that is another way of doing it uh, of course, in all these cases we always also have some standard fluids. So, uh, which, which have a very defined viscosity. So, I can take a standard fluid and I know that standard fluid let us say is a Newtonian fluid and its response is known. So, I can measure its G prime G double prime at high frequency also and let us say it is not corresponding to what I know it should be then I clearly know that uh, there is some problem. For example, if it is a Newtonian fluid then we know that uh, G prime is uh, generally what we will get is uh, uh, G prime uh, will increase as omega squared right and uh, G double prime uh, will increase as omega. So, G double prime will increase as omega. So, this is the result that I will get, but let us say if I collect some data in uh, a rheometer and uh, I get results like this where uh, things are changing and also they seem to uh, so, I, I can possibly say that you know up to this frequency maybe if I look at the slope it is uh, 2 and this slope is 1 and therefore, maybe I can use the instrument only up to this frequency beyond that there seem to be results which are not corresponding to a standard fluid measurement. So, this is also another way of doing it, but in all of these cases what is clear is there is no prescription standard prescription that what do this do this and you will get the good results all of these cases one has to do trial and error and try out different things.
and then so we should always examine whether we are able to explain the results based on the mechanisms that are there in the material.